Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything, geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And of course, you can listen to the show uh, there on the website, on YouTube, on iTunes, tune in, and you can also, of course, uh, tune in later on in the week on Friday nights where we are rebroadcast on a whole bunch of other networks, including uh, Awake, uh, PSN, and I believe People's Internet Radio as well. So lots of places to listen. Uh, if you would like to support the work that we do here at American Freedom Radio, then you can always go to the donate button uh, on AmericanFreedomRadio.com and you can sign up. You can also sign up on Patreon. And of course, if you would like to support me, just me, <laughs> uh, you can always go to Patreon.com slash Pierce Redman. And you can become a subscriber. And uh, very briefly, uh, the the reward system has been changed over for Patreon. So uh, now everybody uh, that subscribes at a dollar or more has access to the exclusive bonus podcast and any exclusive bonus material. So uh, I just switched everything around a few days ago. So uh, if you haven't checked it out, uh, at, you know, for the low, low price of a dollar a month, you can get access to the bonus podcast. All of the bonus podcasts have been changed, so everybody uh, should now have access to them. And I would also like to thank uh, David and Chris, who just signed up a few days ago. Thank you so much. Of course, uh, it's a tremendous help um, for me for maintaining the show and all these other things. So uh, please sign up uh, if you would like to support anything that uh, I do here. But we have a, a jam-packed episode. I doubt we'll even be able to cover everything that we want to. But uh, I am joined by Michael Swanson, who is the author of The War State, as well as uh, Strategic Stock Trading. Uh, you can find Michael's work over at thewarstate.com, as well as wallstreetwindow.com. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, most of the listeners out there will be familiar with Michael, because he, of course is on uh, Tuesday nights. You can hear him on our good friend Chuck Ocelli's show, The Ocelli Effect. But uh, Michael Swanson, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's great to talk with you. Uh, glad to be here. Excellent. Um, well, for, for you know, we, we get new listeners all the time. So uh, quickly, Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Michael Swanson? Well, uh, I, I, um, I, I guess I tell a little bit of, of that uh, to – figure out how did I get into these two topics, investing <laughs> and uh, the war state is the title of the book is. That's what I call it, but basically the American empire. Uh, so when I was a kid, my dad uh, worked in the Pentagon. Uh, he was a colonel uh, during the Cold War. He retired around 1989, right after the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, he worked for the Surgeon General. So I, and so I grew up as a military brat, so to speak, moving around with, uh, as he had a transfer uh, from location to loca lo location to location, but he also uh, I heard an interest in history from him um, and, and reading, and, and my grandfather was in World War II, so I kind of started out like as a young child interested in, in uh, World War II basically, uh, and then as I got older, I understood more, you know, that my dad was in the military too, and uh, you know, kind of had a, a, a I wouldn't say an important job, but uh, but you know, a top level job maybe um, is a way to put it. Um, uh, and then, um, but at the same time, uh, he taught me to be skeptical uh, of things and to try to think for yourself. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and he wasn't like, uh, uh, was, uh, ultra conservative, you know, warmonger or something like that. And really not ever, not <laughs> most people in the military really aren't, um, e even if that can be a stereotype. Uh, but then, you know, I get older and, and uh, I went to college and I intended to get um, 
uh, I was so interested in history. Uh, I also became interested in, in the, the history of the South because we moved to the South and um, in uh, the history of the town. You know, I was living in all sorts of stuff, the civil rights movement. And uh, I went to college and I was intending to – uh, maybe become a college professor or, to, or a community college professor. I got a master's degree in history at the University of Virginia. But uh, while I was there, I got into uh, trading the stock market. Uh, this was in the late 90s, and the internet stocks were going crazy. And so <laughs> I got, got opened up an account and got hooked on that. Uh, it was pure luck, but I had uh, <laughs> that started with a couple thousand dollars of, well, 15,000, not more than, more than just a couple. And, uh, basically tripled that in three weeks. And I mean, it was just complete dumb luck. I didn't know what I was doing. And, uh, but, but that, so you experience something like that you, you, when you, <laughs> you never made that kind of money in, in an entire year. Uh, right, right. It, it, it got me hooked on, hooked on the stock market. And so, I kind of dropped out of the graduate program and got in, you know, ran a hedge fund for a couple of years. I got a, I don't have it now, but I had a series 65 and, and now I run this financial website and, you know, make a business out of that. So, um, so, so that, you know, gives me time to read more books and, and do more writing. And, <laughs> and, uh, and now, so I've kind of returned to, to doing, uh, I can, I'm able to do both things. So I returned to my earlier interest a couple years ago about trying to study, uh, in more detail, <laughs> what are the, you know, the history of, of our empire and, uh, some of the past events, including, uh, you know, ones we don't have the answers to, such as such as the Kennedy assassination. Well, no, excellent. And again, uh, if people um, are, uh, are are not maybe not as uh, interested in uh, the stock market and stuff, of course, Michael, your book, The War State: The Cold War Origins of the Military Industrial Complex on the Power Elite, nineteen forty five, nineteen sixty three. That's available on Amazon. We'll link up to that. Uh, and um, you know, I basically you and uh, Chuck have been covering. The recent Ken Burns and Lynn Novak documentary series on the Vietnam War, and I originally had zero intentions of watching this, but hmm. uh, I I got I got sort of a uh, you know <laughs> not forced into it, but listening to the two of you talk about this, I, I realized well I you know I I kind of wanted to check this out for myself, and I've been enjoying your conversations on this, so um, I I wanted to have you on to kind of discuss this because I have some. Some pretty strong feelings about this uh, documentary. Um, and, you know, it's just a little bit of background. I've always been fascinated by the Vietnam War, particularly the uh, the time period of the, the late 1940s and through the 50s. Oh, OK. Um, that's always been the, the sort of uh, the, the realm of uh, of the war that I've found the most interesting and the most fascinating. Um, and uh, and much of this fascination uh, with understanding the war and the reasons that the U.S. got involved and what really happened um, stems from my father, who um, was drafted uh, when he was 19 years old uh, back in uh, April 1969, which was uh, opening day of baseball. Um, <laughs> you and I were talking about uh, baseball before we started recording. And um, this was before he was even a citizen of the U.S. Um, he was still an Irish citizen at this point. And uh, he served until March of 1971, uh, think you know. Luckily, uh, he served in Germany, um, you know, defending against the threat of a communist invasion, um, you know. Uh, and um, but all the same, he's always uh, been somebody that was uh, fascinated with understanding Vietnam, with understanding why he was, you know, drafted, why he was, uh, you know, even though he was sent to Germany, just in understanding the reasons for being involved and. Uh, you know, he always had a, a bit of a, um, you know, was always fairly upfront about some of the stupidity and the insanity of the war, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and certainly instilled that, uh, you know, in me. And uh, I was actually just talking with him uh, before we were recording some of his own thoughts on uh, the Ken Burns series. And, oh you know, wow! And he thought, um, you know, he was he was a bit fairer to uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novak than than I might have been. Um, you know, he was of the 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 sort of um, the mindset that this is really about making a film about you know Americans uh, involvement and, and and you know mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. more the American side. He did say you know um, uh, he he thought it was a bit heavy on some of the emotional stuff um, and 
you know, I mean, we, we didn't agree on everything, uh, but, um, uh, you know, certainly uh, a few things we did agree on was that the, there's uh, we were shocked that there was no mention of drug use amongst the troops and no mention of drug trafficking, um, uh, you know, that was going on. And, uh, you know, my dad, you know, uh, I said too the my one of my biggest gripes was that the CIA was basically non-existent in this film. And, and my dad you yeah. know, sort of joking like, yeah. And then, you know, every time you see someone that's listed as USAID, you know, that is just a euphemism for CIA. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, that was and, and my dad had some other, you know, things he, he wished that they had gone a little bit more into, um, you know, the the the, the, the they, they talk about troops in the reserve. But, you know, they don't really kind of explicitly hit on the fact that this was basically, um, you know, an easy way of getting out of the war um, mm. that, uh, you know, and, and that politically nobody wanted to uh, actually, uh, you know, force people in the reserves to go into the army. But, you know, my dad was a bit more fair to uh, to Ken Burns um, than I was, uh, certainly. But, um <sighs> Mike, give us your sort of general, uh, you know, the sort of thumbnail sketch of your impression of the Ken Burns film. Well, uh, I've only let me see, I've watched five episodes of it now, so I haven't watched the whole thing. Now, uh, the reason I'm <laughs> the reason I'm well, I'm watching it along with Chuck, you know, because we're talking about it on the show. But I'm also uh, writing a book about the Vietnam War from the years 1945 to 63 uh, as a sequel to that War State book. And um, I was intending to write one all the way up to 68. But what I've discovered is <laughs> the Vietnam War has so many twists and turns that it's really uh, more wars than one war. You know, it's got so many different phases to it that uh, the characteristics of, you know, one five year period is much different. So, like you mentioned the French involvement mm. and and uh, uh, really uh, that's a, you know, most Americans don't know anything about it. And even the Kennedy era, it, you know, we vaguely know much about that, much less anything about the period between 54 and 60. Uh, one, which actually even this documentary barely touches on, uh, but the American imagination or historical memory uh, for most people, uh, I'm 42, uh, so I'll speak of my age group and uh, I think it would go for anyone younger, uh, but our memory of it is from movies, uh, Platoon, Full Metal Jacket, uh, Apocalypse, Apocalypse Now. Now, all these, and they're all, they're great movies, Um and uh classic movies and and uh well that's one thing that strikes me as funny about the documentary the ken burns thing is he says that this is a war no one talks about and it's mm. like hidden and that's not true at all uh no, but another thing my uh just bre you know another thing my dad yeah. said was uh you know the the fact that he that there's no mention of the films that were being made at the time um, you know, and he said, you know, Apocalypse Now, Deer yeah. Hunter, Plato you know, all these things. Yeah, the people Deer were Hunter. commenting on the war uh, through film. And, my, you know, and my dad said, OK, I get it. You know, I mean, you can't include everything. But it is a 20 hour documentary. Um, you know, uh, it's very interesting. Well, stuff even that's left out. Even the mo even a lot of the movies that weren't about Viet weren't set in Vietnam mm -hmm. were actually about Vietnam. MASH, you know, that whole yes, the movie exactly. was made. The, the actual movie was made during the war. There's even I was, I'm a, I was a grew up as a Star Trek fan when I was a kid watching the reruns. And there's several Star Trek episodes about sure. the Vietnam War. And it, the, the episodes are made in 66 or 66 to 68. But um, one of the things about this documentary, you know, I'm. I, I uh, was I, before I watched it. I read some comments people are making about it, and uh, you know I have an interest in the Kennedy assassination, and there's a whole Kennedy assassination research community of people, and and a lot of them were critical before the movie came out because they were saying it's not going to talk about Kennedy withdrawing from Vietnam or his plans to withdraw from Vietnam. I should say, and, and and betray him accurately, and and they thought, well, this is gonna maybe this is to preempt our own research or do this and that, and and so forth. And they're really on guard. Uh, and then I was reading comments, uh, interviews of Ken Burns himself, um, and he said that he's trying to 
I mean, this is avoid historical controversy, basically, <laughs> and not get into debates. He said, I don't want to, because there's wide debates and differences of opinion on the war. Uh, not just should we have been there or not, uh, or, the, or the pro-war, anti-war type thing, but whether the war was even winnable. Uh, and some people make the argument that we could have won the war. Uh, and so there's even some people claiming that we were actually winning it at one point, uh, which I, I don't think is really true, but it doesn't matter. There's just, you know, a huge historical debate why we're even there. All this, he said, you know, before I even watched the first movie that, you know, I realized that's not what this is about. And he talked about in these interviews that he wants to kind of bring people together through showing the history of the Vietnam war and, and how it split our culture or, or the American culture apart. So I think that's like his overriding agenda in watching it. You know, it's, you know, I, I'm <laughs> me and Chuck have talked about it three times. The first time we talked about the first two episodes and because I was, you know, I, I actually enjoyed watching them, even though they left these things out that, makes people it makes a lot of people angry about Kennedy those first two episodes were the, about from the 1945 to 63 time period all compressed into two mm. and there was huge amounts of in, important information really left out uh, completely I mean he doesn't mention like you said he doesn't talk about the CIA at all he has a couple you know you see a couple camera shots of Ed Lansdale but you don't hear who he is you don't hear his name right yeah. I mean it I know, I, I, you know, I, like I said, me and my dad were sort of, uh, not arguing, but, you know, you're sort of discussing this. And, uh, and, you know, and even my dad admitted, you know, to, he was like, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is shocking that the CIA is not, I mean, it's, they're not even like a footnote to this. I mean, there are moments in the film you'd have no idea they were there. Uh, you know, another thing both of us agreed on is, I mean, Laos is, is not mentioned at all. The Shadow, Secret War, and Laos. Cambodia is touched on, uh, briefly. You know, it's just sort of like an aside. But these things are important. In this is my main gripe is is I understand that Ken Burns is is oh his movies are always about emotion. They're not necessarily about the yeah uh, you know analysis of these things. But to me, we've had enough emotion. It's it's you know for the past fifty years, it's been the sort of emotion of Vietnam, <laughs> Whoa, not what, the what's... analysis. One thing that occurred to me this morning, I was thinking about this movie this morning because uh, the last two times me and Chuck have talked about it, I've, I've really been bashing the movie, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, along with him. And and I got I was like, well, I'm, next time I'm going to try to give Ken Burns a side or something maybe. But um, w- one thing that occurred to me is, okay, first of all, I think the movie is, you know, it, it's not really a movie to teach you it's leaving so much out. It doesn't give anyone, I don't think a real historical understanding of, of the war or just some basic facts and, and so forth. How, and, and one of the things me and Chuck were talking about, and he, he maybe brought it up first is he, you know, by not talking about the CIA or real details of the decisions people are making, like Lyndon Johnson is portrayed in the movie as being very reluctant to, hmm. Uh, to to go to Viet to escalate the war, and um, I actually believe that's true. But, but he escalated the war, and the actual facts behind it aren't in the movie. Uh, and even if he was reluctant, doesn't mean uh, he didn't decide to do it. But what the movie does, or what I've seen so far, is it doesn't show policymakers making any real decisions on anything, uh, which isn't accurate. And, um, for instance, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, uh, that's what set me off, uh, about, you know, and starting to bash the thing is because they inaccurately, uh, portrayed it. Uh, so the, the, most people know, but the Gulf of Tonkin incident, there were two attacks. The first one, uh, was an attack on an, you know, these little patrol boats from North Vietnam got 
uh, attacked an American, uh, an American destroyer, didn't do any real damage. But what happened was the, the, <laughs> before this attack happened, they were attacked. Uh, the coast of North Vietnam was attacked by these South Vietnamese guerrillas, uh, in boats too, backed by the CIA as a covert operation. And they didn't, they, our boats, they didn't know if our boats were involved in that attack or not. And our boats were actually in, what they consider to be their territory. None of that's told in the movie, in this mm. documentary. But the funny, I, I bring this up. I, I mean, I know a lot of this detail because I actually did a lot of research on it when I was in college, wrote a, like a 30 page paper on it. But, but, and when I did that research, this was actually in the New York Times after the attack. It's not like a secret. You know, we had these boats and operations going on. Yeah. Uh, so, but what, what really got me, set me off was, the second attack didn't happen, and it's like established history that it didn't happen. I mean, if you go read a book about the Vietnam War, it's going to tell you the attack didn't happen. And um, what I in the day of this attack, the commander of the American boat, uh, uh, Captain Herrick, he cabled in immediately. Uh, why, when it, they, they, they thought they're being attacked. It was bad weather. It was nighttime. The sonar men saw blips and, um, the captain radioed that in. And then hours later, he said, Oh, we now think we probably made a mistake. Can't confirm attack. Don't know. D- expressing doubts of it and so forth. And, and that's not in this movie. They have this guy saying, only the first thing, oh, we were probably attacked and not telling you that he then doubted it. This is just totally misleading and, and, and so forth. But, um, what I'm the main, th- um, uh, so that's what made me mad. I'm like, you know, they're, and they're trying to, and I think they have a subtle agenda, uh, that's not the agenda the Kenny assassination researchers were thinking. And you've seen more of it, so now you, <laughs> when I tell you explain what I'm thinking, you can tell me if, if I'm if you think I'm right or not, because I'm trying to figure it out myself. But um, so the, they said in this thing, oh, well, uh, Johnson, they thought this boat was probably attacked when they really had doubts themselves uh, about it, and the betrayal of of this. Uh, I think this this episode is real critical because it's the escalation of the war. Is basically these guys aren't making decisions, and the war is almost inevitable or something. It's not really, um, you know. It, another way, another way they put this is by saying at the very beginning that we had good intentions over there. Uh, you know, the Vietnam War was good intentions on our part, that or at least the origins of it, and and that implies. Uh, still, like, I think we're not really thinking about it deeply. We're not making real decisions and so forth. And, uh, the movie has soldiers, American soldiers and families of the soldiers who went over there and they're all telling the same story that, you know, we believed in America. We believed in the flag. We, we saw communism as a threat. So we went over there now. Uh, one obvious argument, which Chuck <laughs> makes, is that, and, and your dad would probably make too, is this is not representative of the average American soldier who went over there. You know, yeah, most people yeah. were drafted. They weren't like true believers of, of John Kennedy, especially later in the war. Oh, and when I was talking about the movies, you know, Deer Hunter, uh, The Platoon, and, and on and on, oh, uh, our, my, my generation's thoughts of the, or, or picture of the Vietnam War really comes from the 67 to 72 time period. You know, that's when we had the most troops over there. And that's the Vietnam War, I think, in American memory, not the Kennedy era and so forth. So uh, that's, a, a, I think, a key, key thing to think in mind, keep in mind. But with uh, what the agenda is, so it, it's like, okay, we didn't really know what we're getting involved in and the Americans went over there, the soldiers, they had good intentions too. And, um, we found out it wasn't what we thought it was going to be and so forth. What strikes me is first of all, I don't, I, I, you know, I'm writing a book on the Vietnam war and the whole point of the book is (laughs) to try to get in the mind of Lyndon Johnson and Kennedy and these people and show why they actually made these decisions. That's what I'm trying to 
uh, hopefully accomplishing this. So I do believe they made decisions and knew what they were getting into or didn't get into. And, but I, I don't, you know, misjudge or doubt the, the stories of these American soldiers going over there, whether they're representative of, of everyone. I, I'm, I'm very highly skeptical of, as already said, but what I think the Ken Burns show is doing is actually, you know, his, it, the interviews I saw him make, it's about bringing us together, right? Yes, not, yes. it's not about teaching us the history. It's about bringing us together in some sort of understanding that the Vietnam War, uh, is where the origins of today's, uh, bipartisanship or whatever, or not bipartisan, the opposite of, you know, political partisanship and, you know, polarization began is in the Viet- is during the Vietnam War era. That's all true. But, He's not really teaching us about the Vietnam War itself in a meaningful way, in my view. However, what he is doing uh, in the way he's framing this as, oh, you know, the, the, portraying, I believe, Lyndon Johnson and he, even McNamara and these people is not really making decisions and just, you know, oh, reacting. It's probably an attack and this and that. Um what they're doing is putting those people into the same category as the other people, uh, the Moogie character and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, the soldiers who just have good intentions. And the irony is to me that, that, you know, me and you, you're doing this show and, you know, you obviously know a lot about history and current events and much more than the average person on the street does. But the average person in the street watching this Ken Burns movie doesn't know anything about the Vietnam War, really. You know, they may have watched those movies that, that we watched growing up when they're kids, uh, but that's it. And they don't know anything much else about the Iraq War, uh, the war in Syria going on, or the war in Afghanistan. Exactly. Nothing. You know, what is – uh, Donald Trump say about the war in Afghanistan to make us understand it. Just there's bad people over there and we need to, bu- and we need to bomb them, you know? So we have no understanding of what's happening now. And uh, or most 90% of the people don't except we've got to do these wars and we've got, you know, who, you know, this is my country and I'm not a bad person. So so the country can't be bad either. We got to be doing this for a good reason, at least for self-defense. Um, so I think the movie <laughs> is, is, is written and, and, uh, edited and, and, and dumbed down in such a way that it does not disturb, uh, someone who has absolutely no knowledge about current events or past events or knows anything. You know, it does. So that's kind of my take. They're speaking to somebody who knows nothing. Mm. And and portraying the Vietnam War the same way they're experiencing the wars of today. So the wars of today are like, I don't know anything. I just believe whatever the TV is telling me. And the TV mm. is not – TV does not dissent from the war. Give me an argument on why Afghanistan is bad. And, and, and so – uh, obviously no one knew anything during the sixties either, but reality is they did, you know, the, the Ken Burns show also makes it appear as if the Vietnam war movement <laughs> didn't pick up steam until, uh, 1966 or so. And it shows, um, the last episode I showed or saw, uh, showed hearings that were done in 1966 by the Senate foreign intelligence committee, uh, criticizing, uh, the war, they, they brought up, uh, several, um, uh, uh, George Kennan, who, yes, was right. one yeah, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they bring him up, which it's all good and all. But what's funny about it is now we're seeing in 1966, Ken Burns is showing us, uh, the dissenters of the war, people who think it's a bad idea. And it suggests that no one thought it was a bad idea until then and t- until it started to get mm-hmm. bad in reality. Uh, <laughs> there were lots of people who thought it was a bad idea. Uh, George Ball, who was in Lyndon Johnson's can- uh, cabinet, was dissenting uh, from the get-go. Uh, Robert Kennedy uh, thought it was a bad idea uh, when Johnson was president. Uh, Johnson's vice president thought it was a bad idea. Uh, the, I can name like 
a dozen senators who thought it was a bad idea uh, the, the, from the Kennedy administration on to the Johnson administration. There are lots of people who thought the Vietnam War was not a good idea and who were very well informed on uh, <laughs> on world events and not clueless and, and whatever. So uh, well, yeah, I mean, let, uh, let me just this is again this. Is, I mean, you're hitting exactly on some of my huge major gripes with all this, Michael. I mean, first off, again. Um, whether it was the intention or not, I believe it was Burns's intention, and and Lynn Novak, you know, she doesn't get enough credit for. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's right. To, uh, that's, to maybe she did the whole thing. Or we don't... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, is uh, is this whole bullshit line about you know this was uh, I think it's even in like the first episode. You know, this was uh, started by uh, you know, with good intentions, uh, in good faith by decent people, and that's. A lie, okay? I mean, for, you know, nobody starts a war, uh, really. I mean, with, with good intentions and decent people. I mean, you're you starting a war. You design the ultimate goal is to kill enough people that they they stop. I mean, that's not a good thing. There's nothing, in my opinion, there's nothing noble or just about this. But it it sort of it skirts again. There's they play he plays so fast and loose with history and historical events, especially in the 1950s. When, right. you know, this was a, again, you're talking about the birth of the Central Intelligence Agency. You're talking about America as being essentially, uh, alongside the Soviet Union, the other dominant power source. Okay. So they are sucking up all of these former colonies of, um, you know, France and England, or they're, they're assuming the mantle of being a global power. So it makes perfect sense that they would want to get involved in Vietnam, you know, and I would, I would argue that this was never about good intentions or, or even about, you know, fighting communists. I would argue this is really about uh, controlling the opium trade, which again, is just something that's never explored what, or even uh, spoken about in this, but that, you know, again, like you said, I mean, that there were a, there were people that voiced their opinion that this is bad, but, there were a lot of people that, you know, they, they wanted to do this because this was this was part of their overall strategic plan for uh, not just fighting communism, but for making America into the dominant military and political force around the world. You know, I mean, and that's why we were we were state, you know, uh, I mean, again, there's a whole uh, obsession with Asia. I mean, look at the Philippines, um, you know, there there are and look at you know Ed Lansdale who cut his teeth in the Philippines, rigging elections, uh, using psychological warfare, uh, creating a intelligence and military dictatorship in the Philippines. And then where does he end up next? In Vietnam in the 1950s. I mean, Ed Lansdale was not a decent person, and he had no intentions of, of helping the Vietnamese people. You know, again, this is about the, the birth of the Central Intelligence Agency. Nothing they do is, is for, like, the benefit of the masses. And that's sort of, um, it's just, it's so glossed over throughout, you know? And even like you said, I mean, they, 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 they edit some of the things that Johnson says. Like, I think there's a part where he's, he's speaking with, uh, McGeorge Bundy. Um, right. George, George McBundy. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, that's right. and, uh, you know, it makes it sound like Johnson is like, oh, I, I don't want to get involved and this is terrible. <laughs> and that's, that's not quite the full audio of that, right? And, and like he, He's sort of saying like, oh, I don't want to get involved like right now or something. You know, I mean, it, it's and again to this this idea that um, like you were hitting on before, Michael, it, the, the this notion that the you know it was like a that Johnson and these they weren't really making policy; they just sort of you know fell into this, or they you know it was sort of a mistake or uh, some bad intelligence, and and now they're here. I mean, somebody needs to be held accountable. And it was these politicians and generals that were making decisions. Um, and, you know, I, I don't like there's this again, this sort of this myth that keeps getting repeated throughout the Ken Burns thing that, you know, is, oh, damn, you know, we just sort of bad intelligence and Cold War paranoia. And I just don't really buy a lot of that after a while. Um, and, I, you know, I guess, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but it just doesn't. I, it seems disingenuous. It seems like there is an agenda, like you said, to kind of make, you know, that war is, is uh, this, this sort of um, this event that we can't understand. You know, there's no rhyme or reason. We just sort of fall into it. And I think all of that also 
and this is a huge problem I have with the the Cam Burns thing, is it just it minimizes what the Vietnamese people were fighting for. You know, I mean, they're they're thank you know thankfully he does include some actual Vietnamese people. You know, people that were in the um, National Liberation Front, people that were in the um, the uh, North Vietnamese Army and, and some others. But, you know, their political struggle is just it's sort of like it's not really that important. You know, uh, it, it doesn't you know, it's sort of minimized by the fact that, well, we you know, it was Cold War paranoia. I mean, not that like I, I don't know. They they go back. He goes like back and forth so much. Um you know, in, in certain, uh, like everything has to also have a moral equivalency. I want to get to that a little bit later. But Michael, going back a little bit with the the, the Tonkin Gulf, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, because this is a big one too for me. I almost like kind of fell out of my chair. Is you know the impression is given, and and Burns just the way the narrator says it. It's like, oh, they convince themselves that they were being fired upon. There's nothing else about that. They then said they weren't. It's just they convinced themselves they were being yeah. fired upon. And then Johnson declares war and he already had the resolution written up. So, you know, again, use your brain here. And not even that. I mean, this is like mainstream history. Johnson had the resolution to declare war written up and he was looking for an excuse. And the Maddox gave him the excuse and they knew that, that they were, you know, they knew that this was all a lie. There's also the, you know, uh, NSA reports that they were intercept, you know, that they knew that this was all bogus and that's coming. I mean, I don't know, talk a little bit about that because it, the, again, the Gulf of Tonkin, as the documentary, uh, states was a huge turning point. And obviously this is, you know, one of these big moments and it's just what? sort of glossed over like, yeah, whoops, you know, wrong stuff, but whatever. Now we're here. You know, again, it's like an accident. Well, when, when I watched that two weeks ago, and, and I took a couple notes. I don't have them right in front of me, but when they <laughs> when they talked about the Gulf of Tonkin incident, uh, the, uh, they I, I don't have the exact quote, but the the narrator said something like, "This is this was one of the most consequential events in American history." Mm. The, this this Gulf of Tonkin incident, I was just like, "Well, I, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was like, come on now, that's a little crazy," mm. because. Because, um, as you said, they had the resolution already drawn up. It's not like – this is not Pearl Harbor or something. Yeah. You know, it's that's ridiculous. Uh, so, okay, I, I just – I tell you um, that I've got in, – in the closet somewhere, I've got like a box of documents about the Gulf of Tonkin incident. One of them is a transcript of the National Security Council meeting held – I think it was like 5 or 6 o'clock. And uh, Johnson makes the decision there to do the bombing. And at the end of this discussion, um, <laughs> McNamara says, we won't know if there was an attack until the next morning. <laughs> uh, so so that day, what was really happening was Lyndon Johnson wanted the attack to occur and he was in a hurry to get it to occur. He wanted it to happen before uh, 10 o'clock or so because he wanted it announced on TV so he could give a speech. And it was a political event is what it really was. It wasn't like Pearl Harbor uh, in the sense that we're attacked and now responding. It was really a, a political uh, day, uh, an event in political history. So what happened was uh, Johnson you know, gets in office after Kennedy's killed. Kennedy did have – um, you know, uh, the, the Kennedy assassination researchers, they'll, they point to, uh, National Security Action 263, I think it is, uh, and it says Kennedy wants to pull out, uh, a couple troops before the end of the year and draw down by 1965. And they'll say, well, that's the withdrawal plan. He's getting out of Vietnam. And, uh, I think the, the reality from what I can determine is that, uh, he left his presidency with uh, the objective of we we're on a training mission to train the South Vietnamese and it's over by 1965. And we're, and, and so that's why we're leaving. It's not like, uh, we've got to win mm. in order to leave, you know, but so, so that's changed though. And when Johnson gets in office, um, the very first day of <laughs> that he's there, he has a meeting with um, Robert McNamara, uh, McGeorge Bundy, um, 
and um, Ca- Henry Cabot Lodge. And standing outside the door of this meeting is Bill Moyers, the PBS character. Right, right. And, and he, was, sir, he was one of Johnson's top aides. Now, I bring him up because um, he becomes Johnson's speechwriter – and he's very close to Johnson, like through you know, through years before this. And what's interesting is he won't talk about his experiences with the Johnson presidency. In a, you know, a, a, I've always found one interview with him about it. He's like refuses to talk to historians and and all this kind of stuff. So he gave a he was at a conference on the Vietnam War, and. He makes these comments, which I'm going to ex- tell you what they are right now. So this meeting's over, and he sees Lyndon and Johnson, and Johnson tells him, we're going to go to war in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've got really no choice in this. And, and, and some, something to that effect. So <laughs> he's like this. He knows he's going to, you know, he knows there's going to be a real war. It's not like he waited till the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And on Christmas Day, so this, this talk is – like November 23rd that I, that I just told you, they're 24th. So um, on Christmas uh, Day or Christmas Eve, there's a party in the White House, and he walks up to the Joint Chiefs of Staff at, at this party, and he tells them, um, okay, just let me get reelected, and then you'll have your war in Vietnam. Now, this quote comes from the Stanley Carnell book, Vietnam, which is like the most you know sold book about the Vietnam War since – the last 30 years it's like the standard book you know and the mm-hmm. it's a little outdated but um we, i mean there's newer books out but uh but this is like the the most read book so you know it's a credible source the, he was one of the reporters uh in vietnam too so uh but his whole there's two things going that happen first the joint chiefs of staff pressure him to escalate the war immediately, and they they don't want to just send a couple hundred thousand troops over there. They want to invade North Vietnam and do mass bombing, and and Johnson and McNamara believe that if they do that, the Chinese will intervene like they did in Korea, and this could become a giant regional confrontation, even using atomic weapons, because the Joint Chiefs of Staff war plans call for escalating up to that point the chinese don't have an atomic bomb so they wouldn't have the capability to uh retaliate the soviets though by 1964 they do have the capability to retaliate so it's just you don't know how dangerous it could be if if we did that but that's the joint chiefs of staff plan to actually win is a big war even be willing to use atomic weapons if, if necessary and they actually uh mcnamara though he says well i got a better plan uh, that's that doesn't risk nuclear war, and that is to do graduated escalation, where we will get the jet, we'll tell the Vietnamese stop uh, supporting the insurgency in South Vietnam, or we'll bomb you. And if they continue to do it, we'll bomb you more, and we'll keep doing this until they stop. And he says, "Well, this is what we kind of did in the nuke in the Cuban Missile Crisis. We use the threat of force as a negotiation tactic, so we'll do that." Uh, and, and McNamara pushes Johnson to to do escalations, uh, to bomb uh, before the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And Bundy joins McNamara in doing this. At the same time, uh, Bundy's brother, William Bundy, is in the State Department, mm-hmm. and he draws up uh, what becomes the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that that Johnson uses later. Now, what Johnson tells all these people is. Uh, uh, I I can't do this. He tells the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I can't do this now because I got to get reelected. The American public won't support it, Uh, (laughs) which is an irony when we watch the Ken Burns movie where the American public is asleep or is a a non, is not not a political entity. And, and and he tells the same thing to McNamara and Bundy, just delay, delay, you know, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. But, and he also becomes, you know, um, uh, his, Opponent Barry Goldwater is running, and he attacks him. Says we should go to Vietnam uh, and win, or just pull, or not do anything, which is probably correct. But um, <laughs> but uh, so the, when the Gulf of Tonkin thing happens, Johnson seizes on that as a way to do a small retaliation, a small you know bombing of, of North Vietnam, which is what he does, 
and mobilize the nation under the under the American flag and his leadership and his his poll numbers shoot up and and uh, it's a it's a political win for him and it holds off uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and even McNamara and Bundy <laughs> for a period of time and then after he gets elected uh, the the Vietnamese they do I mean the the Chinese they do finally uh, explode in atomic weapons and now they have atomic bombs which actually I believe makes the Joint Chiefs of Plan the Joint Chiefs of Staff plan that they were presenting impossible to, to even try to implement after they now have atomic weapons, but he still actually does nothing. Uh, and some incidences happen, uh, like there's a bombing of some Americans at a, at a sto- at a cafe somewhere. Some, a couple of American installations are attacked. Uh, Amer- American soldiers are killed. Uh, these things happen two or three times uh, towards the end of 1964. And each time they happen, McNamara and Bundy, uh, you know, pressure Johnson, and he still doesn't do anything. And that pattern continues until uh, 1965. And the Ken Burns documentary shows this battle that takes place um, in South Vietnam, which is big, and it's a huge. They they defeat the Arvin, uh, and a couple American soldiers are killed, and and it really is a big victory uh, for for them. And, and the situation is starting to deteriorate so fast after that that uh, Bundy goes over there and, and, and uh, Johnson then authorizes the mass – the Rolling Thunder campaign. Oh, yeah, which, right, right, right. Yeah, which, which is really – the strategy of that is, is McNamara's game plan of let's just escalate and, there's, and it's, we're supposed to get the North Vietnamese to back down. And none of that works uh, because whenever the North Vietnamese think we're about to escalate, uh, Le Duan, who who is mentioned in this documentary, uh, who by now is the leader, the real leader of North Vietnam, or at least the most, he's head of the Politburo, the most powerful figure. He's sidelined uh, Ho Chi Minh mm-hmm. uh, and really turned Ho Chi Minh into a figurehead. But the pattern becomes that when the Americans are about to escalate, he tries to beat us to the punch and throw as many men down there as he can. And that succeeds in deteriorating South Vietnam, and he starts to win the war. And then, our then finally, our more men come over there, more bombs are dropped, or whatever. And he's kind of the North Vietnamese suffer setbacks, and General Westmoreland will say, "Ah, oh, we're killing more people. We're we're you know we, we see light at the t- light at the end of the tunnel by now." But within six months, the North Vietnamese adjust to the situation. Uh, they adapt to the tactics, whatever we're using, or the more men, or they get more men. We, they get more men, and they start to win again. And it kind of has a seesaw back and forth like that year by year until um, finally, uh, the 1972, and, and Nixon uh, <laughs> signs a peace treaty. <laughs> <laughs> and again, and, I mean, and listen, you know, because I'm sure uh, I, I kind of, you know, I. I me and my dad sort of, uh, you know, argued about this, and and we both kind of agreed. I mean, it is a obviously you can't put everything in a documentary, yeah. you know, and uh, you know, I I think a lot of the stuff, you know, it's almost like I, I'm kind of now reserved to the idea that you know, like the film that like me and you would want to see is just it's a different movie, you know. I mean, it's yeah, a totally right. different film. It's not a Ken. It's never going to be a Ken Burns type thing. Um, but at the same time, it's like a twenty hour f- documentary. I mean the 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 way it's that these things yeah. are glossed over, and again, it's it's I I don't know. To my mind, and maybe I'm being a bit cynical or flippant about this, is it, I've heard about the emotion. You know, I know it was horrible. I'm not denying that it wasn't a you know a, a tremendous strain, but to to use again to to sort of frame everything through these like soldiers' stories, which is you know fine. But to not, as you, you know, like what you just, you just gave us right there, Michael. I mean, there's, there's a reason to this. You know, there, there is a reason that these soldiers are so emotionally scarred at this point. You know, and much of this were, were political decisions by people. And none of this is being acted out in good faith. You know, and none of them were being decent about anything. I mean, like, you know, for instance, um, they, Leslie Gelb, I don't know why the hell they unearthed that fucking you know well that was one thing that actually surprised me watching this was 
because when I read the first when I before I watched the movie, I was reading his interviews by Ken Burns, and he said, "I'm not going to have any talking heads. We're not going to have historians. Yeah, right. We're just going to have soldiers, or basically." And then he's in the movie as a talking. He's yeah. the talking head of the movie, and I was like, "That's there is a talking head. It's Leslie Gelb, you know." <laughs> well, yeah, and I know, and I mean, just <laughs> such a you know an insight. Or I mean, John Negroponte, he he shows up at one point. Oh, I haven't I, gotten to that point yet. Oh, What's, God, yeah, like briefly. And, and I mean, it was just like, ugh. And, and he's, I think he's just referred to as a diplomat, you know, not. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, come on, give me a fucking break. But, you know, I mean, again, like Leslie Gelb is, and, and of course, Leslie Gelb portrays himself as being, you know, again, decent and, and maybe a bit naive and, and whatnot. And, oh, you know, we, we really met well. This is the same guy who endorsed the war in Iraq when he knew it was all BS. And his excuse well, for that, well, but it, it, his excuse for that was, well, everyone else was doing it. So well, it's like the he, same he, thing in he, Vietnam. Well, there, one big problem with, with have, one big problem, and you mentioned it with uh, <laughs> the CIA, is Rufus Phillips is in the movie, and he mm. was he, he was an important CIA figure, and I'll connect this to Leslie Gelb in a second, but he's a very important figure in the CIA. He was in charge of... Uh, DM's uh, the the U.S. component the U.S. side of DM's strategic Hamlet program. He was the guy in charge of that in the 1950s. He was in Laos. He was yes. <laughs> uh, he was the, like the station chief of Laos, basically, and um, and uh, working right under D- at Lansdale. And but what's funny is he's called you already kind of hinted at this, but he's called USAI, USAID. Yeah. It doesn't say he's CIA. Mm. And with Les- Leslie Gelb, it's funny because. Uh, the 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 subtitle for him is Pentagon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> if I wrote the doc, if I made the documentary, yeah, he was in the Pentagon under Robert McNamara. But you know, he's also uh, he wrote a book in 1975. You know, how different would it be to listen to Leslie Gelb as an expert if you didn't if you put up the title of his book that he wrote in the 70s uh, about the Vietnam War. Uh, in the title of that book was the system worked. So I like to hear that <laughs> argument. <laughs> Ask him well, about and, that. <laughs> no, I know. And, and when, you know, it, again, the, 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 there's a, a sequence of Leslie, Leslie Gelb where, you know, he, he recounts his version of, of McNamara being like, I want a full history of the, the war yeah. thus far that becomes the Pentagon Papers. Um, which is ne- almost, I don't, no, I, I haven't seen every, I've watched the first five episodes in their entirety, and I've oh, watched okay. like s- episode seven and, and part of episode eight, you know, I've skipped around a bit. Yeah. So maybe the Pentagon Papers are mentioned again, but as far as I remember, it's only this one time where, and it's Leslie Gelb, who is, uh, you know, he's, oh, uh, I, and, and then I started looking through, through, uh, you know, Bob's uh, files, and I, I started to see, oh, this is all a lie. That's it. You know, th- there's what's a lie? You know, I mean, yeah, you're saying question. that this whole thing is a lie, I, I, and and that's my my serious problem with a lot of this. Ken is like he he, you know, it's like he kind of takes you up to the water's edge, but he won't let you get your feet wet. Again, with uh, the Gulf of Tonkin, it's like so the Maddox convinces itself that they're being fired upon, and then Johnson has the resolution ready. It's like Ken, go, you know, put connect the dots here um this is again this is the same ship that johnson and others have been telling you know uh they even mentioned earlier uh before they kind of uh get to the whole gulf of tonkin that the, you know that the, these boats were there to provoke the north again what the hell were they doing this close to the yeah. to the north vietnamese border um right that's never brought up but it, it, you know same thing with this leslie gelb pentagon papers it's like um, so again, this decent man knew that it was all a lie. We're not going to explore that later. You know, let's just get more kind of emotion, uh, of, you know, and, and I, I think we'll, we're, we're almost, um, coming up to the break, but I definitely want to talk about the, the Mogi character. Um, I, okay. I know you had some issues with him and as did I, um, and it was just sort of a strange thing, but. But anyway, uh, I'm speaking with Michael Swanson, the author of uh, The War State. You can find his stuff at thewarstate.com. We're going to be continuing the conversation in the second hour, so stay tuned.
world's meeting place. American. It's practically narcotic. Freedom. Oh, yes. I like very much. Radio. You're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. Since the beginning, civilizations have risen and fallen. Rome. Ancient Persia. Mongolia. Britain. And now, America. Befallen by natural disasters, broken families, moral decay, lack of preparedness and conflict. Don't let this happen to you. Are you prepared? Would you like to help others prepare? AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com is looking for distributors. Email BugOutAmerica at USA.com. Go to AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, a veteran-owned and operated company. But do it today. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me in <laughs> American Freedom Radio. Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network and, uh, and we just need that so much. And when we're not invading some sovereign nation or setting it on fire from the air, which is more fun for our Nintendo pilots, then, then we're usually declaring war on something here at home. Did you ever notice that about us? We love to declare war on things here in America. Anything we don't like about ourselves, we declare war on it. We don't do anything about it. We just declare war on it. It's the only metaphor, the only metaphor we have in our public discourse for solving problems, declaring war. We have to declare a war on everything. We have a war on crime, the war on poverty, the war on litter, the war on cancer, the war on drugs. But you ever notice, we got no war on homelessness, huh? No war on homelessness. You know why? There's no money in that problem. No money to be made off of the homeless. If you could find a solution, if you could find a solution to homelessness where the corporate swine and the politicians could steal a couple of million dollars each, you'd see the streets of America begin to clear up pretty quick. I'll guarantee you that. I will guarantee you that. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio at Ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs and artillery batteries not included. Launch sequence initiated. Mind to experience American Freedom Radio. Welcome. 
Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Okay, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redmond. Uh, if you are just joining us right now, we have been speaking with Michael Swanson, of course, the author of The War State. Uh, you can find all of his work at thewarstate.com, as well as uh, Tuesday nights on The Ocelli Effect. Uh, and, uh, of course, if you would like to support my work, then uh, you can always go to patreon.com slash Pierce Redmond, uh, where the uh, the reward system has been lowered to a dollar a month. But anyway... Um, we, uh, Michael, we were, uh, right as we got towards the end there, I mean, we were, uh, harping on about Leslie Gelb, um, of course, some, and, you know, just for anyone that is unaware, again, because I feel like there's a lot of people watching this, probably not, you know, our audience, but, um, you know, I mean, he's like a council on foreign relations, Brookings Institute, I mean, he's just like this slimy little scumbag, um, who's made a whole career out of basically... You know, again, convincing people that he's a decent man with good intentions um, <laughs> and, and getting people into wars. I mean, they look slimy in the movie. Oh, my God. I know. His like, eyes are like deep set into his head. I mean, no. Yeah, he's just disgusting. <laughs> um, you know, and you, you, were, you, um, you mentioned Rufus Phillips. Again, a, a quote, USAID. Um, uh, well, the thing, about, the thing about Rufus Phillips is. I, 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 he lives in Virginia. He, I've never met him, but he's 89. I've looked it up. He's 89 years old. I thought about trying to go interview him, mm. uh, because he's actually, he's written a book about Vietnam and his experiences. That's, that's fantastic. Mm. And, um, he's, um, you know, uh, so I, I mean, the book is fantastic and, and critical of the war and, and, and um, he's just, Anyway, there's a bunch of interesting stories about him, and what what that makes me wonder though is he's in this documentary and he's interviewed a whole lot. They don't tell you who he is, and I, I would just wonder if they if they got lots of good thing, lots of interesting statements from him that they just edited out, and it, the whole show is sanitized. Like I don't know, maybe Leslie Gelb did explain right. why the war was a lie, but we're not going to see that, you know. So. That, that's a high, there's a big possibility that this thing is just edited down so much that these people said lots of stuff worthwhile that we just can't know about, you know. Oh, and, and it is interesting, too, that the, you know, a lot of these talking heads like Gelb, um, George Wicks, an OSS agent, um, is, is uh, featured. There's uh, Robert Gard, who worked at the Pentagon, John Negroponte again. Um, a, a Donald Gregg, who I want to get to, a CIA agent, they seem to really be kind of mostly in like the first couple episodes. And then as you continue on, they're, they're sort of, they, they disappear and it becomes very much, you know, the, the, the various soldiers. Musgrave is one of them and, uh, you know, there's a few others. And I guess that kind of makes sense. And that's, again, I mean, I'm not, you know, it, it's, Burns and Novak have a, you know, they're, they're trying to craft an entertaining documentary as well. You know, to, well, the, keep the, that in mind. Yeah, well, the Donald Gregg thing. I mean, he's. I mean, like I'm saying, like I read that. Oh, I'm not going to have talking heads because I don't want to get into historical debates. Look, Leslie Gelb, you know, was involved in the Pentagon Papers, so he's connected to Vietnam. But I don't think Donald Gregg had as any connection to Vietnam. If he does, it's a covert one that we don't know yes. about. Oh well. So, no, uh, so yeah. why is he even in the movie? I, it doesn't make sense. Well, no. So. Now, now that you bring it up, I will <laughs> tell you he had a deep connection, and this was an, again one of my major issues with this whole thing is the the Phoenix program gets about uh, a five minute mention in this whole movie. Okay, and we're talking about the you know this is a CIA program that is essentially. Uh, the, the building blocks for how the CIA operated in uh, in Central America, later in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, this is like the war on terror. Okay, this is the CIA's counterterrorism program, um, uh, basically, you know, torture, murder, drug trafficking, all sorts of horrible things. Um, and, 
And Donald Gregg was a prominent player in the Phoenix program. Okay. And, uh, and then of course, just after Vietnam, where does Donald Gregg show up in Iran Contra training right. and, you know, funding the Contras in Nicaragua. So again, in, in, you know, it's so many of these characters, you know, they, they cut their teeth in Vietnam only to then repeat these, these programs and stuff later in Central America. And then even after that in Iraq. John Negroponte. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, you know, that to me is just so disingenuous that you have this guy who, and then, like I said, the Phoenix program, it's mentioned for about five minutes in episode seven. They basically make it sound like the Americans were just, quote, advisors. And they didn't, you know, they didn't really get their hands dirty. Again, it was the Vietnamese that did all the dirty work. And this is, again, couched with... um there's this one of the soldiers that they interview is a guy, Lieutenant Vincent uh, Okamoto, um, and he is uh, he's interviewed a few times in the film. You know, there's there's one sequence where he describes th- um, they come to a village uh, and he suspects that there you know there's too much rice in the village for just a few old ladies, so he thinks, oh my god, they're you know maybe there are troops here or something. Mm-hmm. He finds one of these tunnels. He throws a grenade in there you know, and just obliterates a whole bunch of men in there. Um, and then, you know, later when we see him again, he's a member of the Phoenix program criticizing more or less Vietnamese, you know, the, the PRU who were the provisional reconnaissance unit. I, I right. believe. You know, these were the, these were the foot sold, the Vietnamese foot soldiers in the CIA's Phoenix program. You know, he kind of says, yeah, they were really brutal and nasty. Uh, you know, what was throwing a grenade into a tunnel? I mean, I understand it's a war, but, you know, that again is just sort of, there's this weird, you know, it's when the Vietnamese do it, it's somehow worse than when we do something. And then furthermore, the Phoenix program, Burns has in it, you know, the narrator says, uh, later during a congressional hearing, the director of the Phoenix program admitted that he didn't know how many of the 20,000 killed <laughs> were innocent. The director has a name. His name is William Colby. And he was the head of the Saigon station for the CIA. And then later was Nixon's, you know, uh, was the director of the CIA under Nixon. I mean, they can't mention William Colby's name. Um, you know, so uh, again, it's just they, the, the white, the, I mean, not even whitewashing. I mean, it's almost like the complete, um, uh, you know, uh, just obscuring that the CIA even, you wouldn't know the CIA had a role to play. In in through this, this well, documentary, that's actually one one little thing about you. Know, like, okay, the, like the past two two or three years, I've actually been reading a lot of books about the Vietnam War, newer books, uh, ac- including academic books. And when I was, I mentioned I wrote something about the Gulf of Tonkin thing, but that was like in 1998 or something. Mm-hmm. And, and really, I, I had read a lot about the Vietnam War back then. And then I just set the topic aside until like two years ago. And now I'm just like, you know, I'm reading the Pentagon papers and, and, and all this kind of stuff. But there's lots of new information and, and new perspectives about the war. Um, in particular, uh, the South Vietnamese have, you know, and the North Vietnamese, the, the whole, this Ludon character in this movie, was not written about 20 years ago uh, at all, except like very brief mention. And and what's happened is um, there's been some Americans that have gone to North Vietnam and have had access to to their ar- archives and or some of them and, and been able to get uh, a little bit of their perspective on the war. I just read a book uh, a few months ago that's the North Vietnamese – or well, they're, now they're the Vietnamese <laughs> – <laughs> His, uh, their history of the war, which is which is uh, interesting, but uh, what I, the point I'm saying this is that in the past, like 20 years ago, if you read a lot of books about the Vietnam War, one of the themes, which is in this movie, um, is that the South Vietnamese are just bad people. Yeah. Uh, Deem is a terrible person. He's these monks burn themselves up because he's a terrible person. And then his successors, they're all terrible people. And, and a lot, and so the war, the argument is then, uh, the war was unwinnable. And, uh, an earlier form of that argument was GM had a government that was sort of viable, no matter how bad he was. But once he was gone, 
there was no viable government in in uh, in Vietnam uh, that we were defending, and that's why we lost the war. Um, and the I haven't seen this Phoenix program thing yet, part of it, but that sounds like more of the same. You know, that's it's not so much our American soldiers are doing bad things, or or the war is bad or anything like that. It's just the bad things are being done by these South Vietnamese people. And even this episode, the last one I saw in 1966, uh, they have this guy you mentioned in Moogie. He's an American soldier who goes over there and is a true believer. And of course he dies. Uh, and Ken Burns or the documentary is interviewing his, uh, mom and his sis, his sister, and they're saying that once he went over there, they became skeptical of the war. And one of the things they didn't like seeing were some of these South Vietnamese leaders mm-hmm. on TV and they didn't like them. And, and again, implying that they were the problem and, and so forth. Now, I'm not trying to argue that they were good or something, but I do argue, do want to argue that they are not the reason why the war was lost. It's not that the, and there's very little understanding at all of, uh, of these people. I mean, DM, I, I, you know, writing, you know, I'm, I'm writing history, <laughs> writing the book, the, the, that war state book and this book about Vietnam. And I approach history, not trying to demonize people, um, uh, or, uh, you know, I may think someone's wrong, <laughs> but I try to under- try to put out there why it is they think they do so we can understand why they're wrong. So like with the Vietnam War, I think the policymakers uh, going back to the 1950s and, and all of them had ways of thinking that led to the Vietnam War and led to disaster, basically. And it's and to prevent future wars, we need to understand how they really what their what their strategic view is and whether it makes sense. Now, with the South Vietnamese, um, uh, that, what's funny about about them? <laughs> you know, I'll stop rambling on about it. Uh, <laughs> but the after one of the things I've, I've discovered, you know, reading this new literature that's out there is that when Diem was overthrown, there was a succession of uh, South Vietnamese generals that were overthrowing each other. And, and they show this in the Burns documentary. And that's the story, you know, that of 20 years ago, all these guys are all overthrowing each other. So there's no legitimate government. Well, the, this uh, premier Thu and Kai, uh, who they show in the documentary is a young guy with a mustache, and they just say bad things about him. He's crazy, he's mean, or whatever oh, yeah, it is. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just flippantly. He likes to drink, and <laughs> yeah, he likes to drink and do this and that. He's actually very, he's a very interesting character. And uh, what he does is he's head of their air force, uh, and he's trained by William Colby as as uh, yes. uh, as a as a part of um, when Kennedy was president. Uh, he was flying people into North Vietnam to try to do commando missions, and these people would all end up dying and getting captured. But he was working with the CIA, and and he was womanizing, and he wasn't an alcoholic, but you know he was partying, and he was a younger guy, and, and so forth. So the way he becomes this important figure in Vietnam is these generals keep overthrowing each other, and then they decide, well, we got to stop doing this. So let's find someone who's not super ambitious. And won't overthrow us, so they pick him to become their leader. And they they actually what they are doing is recreating the Soviet Politburo because that's what happened <laughs> under Stalin. You know, Khrushchev is plays the bumbling fool that's not going to hurt you, right, and right, he, right, right. And he takes over. That's exactly what this guy did. And uh, and they actually start calling themselves a Politburo. So I, I just say this because it's an irony that we're fighting the Vietnam War against communism and it ends up that the, the rulers of South Vietnam end up copying <laughs> the, the political structure of of, of, uh, of, you know, Soviet of the Soviet Union and North Vietnam itself. So uh, but so anyway, I've just kind of got off on a tangent 
here, but no, um, no. But you know what? That I mean, that that brings up a uh, something I actually wanted to get to. Uh, one is okay. the, the the way that they the way that the the documentary covers the assassination of uh, and the coup against uh, Ziam and his brother. Oh Hugh. yeah. But but also, I mean, like what you were saying there too is this. Um, again, it 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 so much of the the documentary seems to be predicated on a lot of these sort of more antiquated historical notions like <laughs> yeah it the, does yeah the south is is they're brutal and they're dumb and they're nasty you know it's it's like like when they said the phoenix program well it was mostly the south vietnam you know it was just some american advisors that were checking it out and again they won't they won't come out and say cia you know they say the cia created it but they won't say that these are cia advisors they won't say that when Lieutenant uh, Okamoto was, uh, you know, inducted into the Phoenix program. He essentially became a CIA agent. Now, he might have retained his military rank, but, you know, Ed Lansdale never, you know, he was an Air Force. uh, Well, Um, I'll I'll, I'll go go back to something you said said, uh, an hour ago that's really important. So the reason I bring up, you know, these guys are portrayed as being so brutal and, and that's why we lost the war is because in reality, I mean, I'm not saying I like them, but look, DM, what DM did was he arrested 30,000 pe- people in 1959. Okay. Uh, people that were political opponents, people that he suspected were VC may not have been VC along with probably 10,000 VC. Mm. He arrests 30,000 people and maybe 500 are murdered, something like that. Uh, we don't know. But most of these people were actually let go. Um, let's say 2,000 were murdered, you know, and then and, and 28,000 are, are let go. Um, and, and the idea is he's taught them a pretty tough lesson, you know. <laughs> well, here and – then, and then these uh, monks uh, kill themselves too because – there was a political dispute over over flying Buddhist flags, and it just blows up and gets out of control, really. Um, now, and that's that's what's on our Amer- that was what was on our American TVs, and it still makes for good videos um, in uh, in this documentary. Goodness, so that's the level of oppression under DM. Now, he didn't allow political uh, parties uh, of any sense. No, the elections were fake. You know, he let people run if he knew, you know, he he let them run. Basically, you couldn't run without his permission. So it's not a democracy. It's not a republic, even though that's not that's in the name of the country. But but um, (laughs) in South Korea, there is much more brutal uh, oppression in the 1950s uh, before the North Korean War and immediately afterwards in Indonesia in the 1960s. Uh, at the, in in around sixty six sixty seven, over a million people were killed mm. in uh, in a bloody um, by the dictatorship there. Uh, after the coup in Guatemala in nineteen fifty four, hundreds of thousands of people were murdered by that government uh, in the in the next decade. In the nineteen eighties, uh, this Donald Gregg character was in Nicaragua doing stuff, but. Uh, yeah, simple, God similar, only knows how yeah, many. I mean, well, graves. I don't. I don't know how many people were killed in in that war, but uh, lots of people were killed in the war in El Salvador. Mm. You know, it basically uh, with death squads. So um, uh, the point of this is that <laughs> the South Vietnam, I the the Vietnam, the South Vietnamese did not lose the war because they were brutal. Because we were actually supporting people more brutal than they were elsewhere that didn't lose wars and and whatnot so my argument of why the vietnam war was lost goes back to what something you said earlier and that is that (laughs) ho chi minh was seen as the is a legitimate nationalist and the french weren't you know Mm. this they had the emperor bo dai who's not even mentioned in the whole darn i know no, no, it's just a, a succession of, you know, emperor puppets. It's like, name these people. <laughs> it was Rui Wan, him. There, was, yeah. there wasn't there was a succession of puppets. Mm. It was He was the guy from the whole time, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, of 45 to 54. Uh, 
it wasn't another person. So, <laughs> no, and I, I, like you're saying there too. I mean, again, the, the the film is doesn't portray. I mean, I get a lot of problems with the way the you know, for one thing, you know, they go through the whole process of of describing that Viet Cong is a derogatory term. You know, meaning, you know, communist, traitor, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, then why don't you call them the Viet Minh or call them the, you know, the uh, NLF? Mm. You know, they, they won't. It's like they go through the whole like this is a, a messed up term, but then they keep using it. You know, and I, I it's just like people will understand it. You know what I mean? I mean, if if if, if the public is too dumb to understand that, you know, Viet Cong, you know, NLF means Viet Cong, then they shouldn't. They should have, you know, then they shouldn't be forming an opinion about the Vietnam War if you, if they can't under, you know, so it, but like you said, I mean, the, the, um, it, so much of this is, is just sort of a, a like, like the, the whole idea that, uh, you know, ZM is, is the worst dictator ever. Um, you know, it's very funny. I, it just made me think when you were saying that. I mean, if it would, if he was more brutal and he would have won, would then he not be so, you know what I mean? Like, in Guatemala, we don't really care how many people died. We don't care how many people uh, were, were murdered in the, uh, in, as you say, in Indonesia in the 60s. Um, you know, some of that approved by uh, Henry Kissinger and others. Um, but again, it, it's the, the South Vietnamese are, are always portrayed as being horrible um, and ZM as being the, the absolute worst. And I do wonder if a lot of that is just, you know, chalk that up to, well, because he could, you know, he lost. If we had won, who would have cared, you know? Um, and, and maybe he would have had to be more brutal. The same way that um, uh, Le Juan is, is just sort of this, you know, he's uh, he's very much portrayed as this sort of conniving, um, you know, evil communist and, and what. And I'm not saying he wasn't, but again, that's, it's, it's sort of, it's denying the fact that it was a, you know, a liberation movement. You know, and I, I'll say right now, I'm not now, nor have I ever been a communist. I don't really <laughs> think communism is cool whatsoever. I'm not even, you know, crazy about socialism. But don't, you know, it's these people were fighting, you know, for their freedom from, you know, the imperialists and whatnot. And that's never really addressed in the movie. You know, I mean, it's like these sort of platitudes about communism. But the real political struggle that these people were, you know, they were, they fought the French, they fought the Japanese, then they fought the French again, then, you know, they're going to fight the Americans. I mean, and, you know, the, the, that they were, there were legitimate grievances, economic ones and whatnot. Um, that's never really a thing. You know, it's just sort of this, um, uh, you know, amorphous, evil communist, like, you know, Le Juan in, in, uh, Hanoi. That's it. You know, we don't really need to, again, too, I mean, like, you know, ZM wasn't popular too, in part because Ho Chi Minh was actually, you know, a true popular, popular leader. You know, he did have the support of millions of, of Vietnamese all over. Um, and just briefly, I wanted to, the way that the coup, again, is, um, is portrayed is another one that just really kind of got me all hot and bothered over this is, uh, one, the CIA is apparently just a bit player, according to this documentary. That they're just sort of on the periphery, you know, and, and he said, and, and in the documentary, it says that, well, a group of generals contacted the CIA asking what they, uh, what, what would, what would they do if they mounted a coup? And then we're given the impression that this whole coup is between the Undersecretary for State, Robert Hillsman Jr., and Henry Cabot Lodge. There's no mention of the fact that the CIA's, um, sort of, man uh, at that at that point was uh, Lucian Conin, who was um, a, you know, OSS guy. He was very close with the Corsican Brotherhood, which was the main heroin opium trafficking organized group operating in Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam and Thailand as well. And that he oversaw this coup and that he was, you know, relaying information back and forth. And, and Conin is again, He's the guy that is supposedly the person that sort of set up the truce between the Corsican opium, opium smugglers and the CIA. Um, he then later ran secret operations for the DEA under Nixon. And on top of all this, he also, um, you know, he was a, a, um, a mentor to Daniel Ellsberg. <laughs> and none of this is like crazy conspiracy stuff. 
This is all mentioned in his obituary in the New York Times. So uh, that to me is just, I understand you can't fit all of this stuff in, but to not eat, to make it seem like the CIA didn't know. There's a line from Leslie Gelb in this where he says, well, DM really bossed us around. You know, he yeah, was, yeah, I and, saw I that. Mean, I saw that. Give me a fucking break. Yeah. You know, was- I mean, it, that, that doesn't have, you know, if he really, you know, then he wouldn't have been killed. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, any, Michael, if you, any, any kind of thoughts on, on any of that stuff? I mean, I know we're kind of, I keep going back to this. Um, it, it just sort of drives me insane. Um, that the, the CIA is such a bit player in all this. So I don't know. Maybe if you have any thoughts on that, we can get, or, or else we can kind of move on. Well, I, I, I'm, I'll address that in a second. I want to go back real quick to, before I forget it, to mm. the, the, about the, the, you mentioned the Le Duan guy. Um, I just want to say real fast that one thing about, and then I'll talk about Coney. Uh, one thing about the, the documentary is it portrays Le Duan as being, uh, like a Mao style communist. Mm. It suggests this uh, one, at least once. Oh, closeness with the Chinese. Yeah, cl- closely aligned with the Chinese. In reality, that's that's not true. Now, in North Vietnam, uh, there were these land reform programs that were going on, which the the documentary uh, accurately portrays. I mean, they they were rounding people up and you know uh, <laughs> redistributing their land, killing people, arresting people, and this and that. Um, however, uh, this this program was nothing like what Mao did. I mean, Mao literally killed tens of millions of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, it, again, comparable violence is violence. As I was saying, Diem isn't as bad as as some other American dic- – uh, as some other – Shah dic- or something. Is, yeah, <laughs> as some other dictators. The, what the North Vietnamese were doing were, was nothing comparable to, to China. And, the, and these land reform programs are going on in the 1950s. Now, what's inaccurate in this is that um, – Le Duan, and, and, and it's about the, it goes back to the agenda of this, this documentary. Who Le Duan actually was in the 1950s was he was the person on the Politburo in charge of the insurgency of South Vietnam. So that was his perspective. He wasn't in charge of land reform. He wasn't going to China and all that kind of stuff. He was in charge of, of the insurgent in South Vietnam, and that's why he always had this more aggressive uh, posture to the war than than Ho Chi Minh and some of the others did. Uh, now there were people that were more oriented to China than he was, or, or Ho, and Ho Chi Minh also wasn't orientated toward China. These people were first nationalists. And, right. uh, and, and this, you know, the, <laughs> the ultimate proof of the nature of, of the North Vietnamese government is that in 1978, I think it is, uh, China actually invades them. So yeah, they, they fought a war <laughs> with China just after. Yeah. 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 yeah so, but, um, with Ho Chi, uh, Lucien Conin, uh, I actually, uh, read, his uh, he did he gave testimony to the church committee about his role mm-hmm. in the coup uh, with DM uh, and these generals, and the way he describes it, these generals are meeting with him and telling him almost everything that they were going to do and making sure they got his okay. He would run to Henry Cabot Lodge and tell him what was going on, and then run back to the generals and just gave them the green light and. As far as murder of DM goes, they had a conversation with him where they basically hinted at murder and Conan cut them off and said, I don't want to know, you know, don't tell me, you know, but, <laughs> but did, but said, you know, basically implied like a mob boss would. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell me the details basically. Yeah. Like a mob boss. Yeah. So he didn't, he didn't say don't do it. He didn't say go murder him. But and so forth, and then um, not all the generals knew they were going to murder him. That were involved in it, and some of them get angry, you know, after GM's killed. And but uh, anyway, that's. The, but the other interesting aspect of of the coup is while it was going on, the guys in charge of it uh, were meeting of Conan, like minute by minute, telling him what was going on. You know, coming to his office and and stuff like that. So. It wasn't so much he 
he he didn't create the coup. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't put it that way. He didn't organize it, but he gave them permission to do it. And without that permission, they wouldn't have done it because then they would have the question in their back of their mind. If we do this, will the U.S. stop giving us money? Will Kennedy uh, pull the plug? Mm. Uh, they needed to know that wouldn't be the case. And Conan told them it wouldn't be. Well, and, and also, again, the, the portrayal of this is, uh, is sort of like Kennedy is kind of his hands are tied and he kind of says, okay, we'll do it. I mean, some of these CIA, you know, again, they're not coming to Kennedy and asking. They're coming to Conan, again, a, a noted, um, you know, uh, opium smuggling asset for the CIA. They're not, they're not asking, you know, it, the, 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 uh, the, this sort of, again, the, this sort of silly portrayal that it sort of, oh, Kennedy kind of fell into it. No, that's not how these things work. The same way that, um, uh, when they talk about the Phoenix program and they, well, the American advice, they were just sort of advising or looking, you know, they were standing on the sidelines while the PRU, you know, waterboarded people. No, they learned how to do this from the CIA. You know, they, the CIA was in charge. They were saying, this is what we're going to do. Go do it now. Um, there, there weren't this bit player that was sort of on the periphery of all this stuff. I mean, not to mention Ted Shackley and, and Laos and the, you know, the Hmong people. Um, you know, I mean, a big, th- you know, like I said, when uh, my dad and I were sort of talking about this, and, he, you know, he said he would have he would have enjoyed something about the drug use in Vietnam because it was just so rampant among the soldiers. You know, and I told him, I was like, yeah, but if you do that, you know, then it becomes, well, how did the heroin you know, how was there so much heroin in South Vietnam? Oh, well, a lot of it was coming from Laos. Well, who was growing it? Yeah. Laos? Oh, the Hmong people. Who was the Hmong <laughs> working for? Oh, well, Ted Shackley. Oh, how did they get the opium there? Air America. You know, I mean, it becomes this like over, you know, it did. And I understand that Burns, I guess, didn't want to go there, but it, it just seems so disingenuous when it was such a huge. I mean, again, the whole, the concept of the war on drugs comes out of Nixon. And his, you know, irritation at what was going on in Southeast Asia. So it, and I, I don't know, maybe that, that kind of brings us, um, mm. a bit to, um, uh, again, some of the, the lessons learned, which I, I don't, and I know <laughs> you and Chuck kind of, um, went into this. And I, I wanted to talk a bit with you about this because it, I mean, there are almost no lessons learned according to this documentary. Um, in that, I mean, you look at Afghanistan. I mean, we're now there even more longer than we were in Vietnam. Um, granted the, the deaths aren't the same, uh, you know, uh, that, that's, but, um, I mean, for the Afghan people, it's the same as Vietnam. Um, you know, the same as in Iraq. I mean, there's just millions of people killed, um, millions of people affected by all the chemicals and, and stuff that we've dumped all over, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, you know, not to mention all sorts of other places that we're involved with. And I just wanted to get your, your take on that, uh, Michael, again, as someone that is, you know, um, you know, studied uh, the impacts of the Cold War and, you know, the particular view on how that's now affecting us uh, today. Um, and, you know, again, some of the things you, I'm sure you were uh, talking about in the war state, you know, warning uh, of the, the sort of legacy of all this stuff. But, uh, and I understand that it's not necessarily Ken Burns and Lynn Novak's prerogative to discuss this. But again, it just seems like, um, I don't really, to be honest, and I, I don't, I'm not trying to sound rude to people that, that suffer. I don't really care so much about the emotion of this. I do care that it seems as if the war in Afghanistan is, a, is an unending Vietnam, you know, where at, we've, 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 we have learned some lessons about Vietnam in that you don't allow the media in, um, you, you know, more sort of, uh, uh, air support, you know, more Air Force stuff or drones are even better because now you don't even you don't we don't get pilots being shot down and more special forces and more CIA, the you know, more use of proxy forces. So, you know, whatever the Mujahideen in the 80s, um, you know, Al Nusra in Syria, whatever it may be. Um, those seem to be the lessons learned, which are basically, you know, then you can have a Vietnam style conflict without as many of the harsh consequences for us. So I don't know, Michael, your perspective on this. Well, I, the lessons learned, I mean, that's what I was 
<laughs> from different perspectives, <laughs> the perspective of the American people or this movie, uh, when I say the American people, I'm, I should qualify that for someone who doesn't really know much. Uh, if I think about the Iraq war, uh, before the Iraq war started, uh, the, the, the one with George Bush, uh, first of all, my dad, he didn't go to Iraq, but <clears throat> he was called up in the Desert Storm War mm. to go to, to drive up to Washington uh, every week, uh, and t- right as the war started. And, you know, I, I know more than the average person about the Pentagon and, and, and <laughs> these <laughs> topics. And I can tell you, like, the lead up of the Iraq War, uh, the second one, uh, my dad had passed away by then, but I knew we were going to go to war. Uh, and there was no, like, oh, is Saddam going to surrender or something or some diplomacy or nothing like that uh, because we sent medical units over there and you're not going to send them over there unless there's a war coming. Those are doctors and so forth. And, and that was done like six months before. But at the same time, I was reading things in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the major newspapers where you could find articles where they're interviewing uh, generals uh, that were skeptical of the war, uh, of the second Iraq war, that we would actually be able to create a better situation over there and it was in our strategic interest. You could actually, I mean, this wasn't like, this wasn't on television. You feel Donahue might have been on there saying some stuff, but they quickly took him off the air. Uh, <laughs> the point of this is the the metaphor or similarity is that the Vietnam War was the same way. There are lots of people skeptical before 1965, and now with the Iraq War, you know the the person who only knows what they see on Fox News. Uh, you know, five, six years after the start of the Iraq war and it goes bad and all that, they are just think, well, we just had good intentions and, and Bush thought their chemical, we- uh, yeah, thought he had chemical weapons and this and that. And we just had good intentions. It's the same exact thing that, you know, is being portrayed, uh, in this movie. Uh, now, so no, no lessons have been learned. If you just want to make that argument that we had good intentions and, and it went bad, that's not actually – I don't think teaching anyone anything valuable beyond – we got disagreements that go back to the Vietnam War with political polarization. So I think the actual lessons of the Ken Burns movie are fairly meaningless uh, for, for us. As far as the kind of type of lessons you're talking about, that's the perspective of <laughs> the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the National Security State. Right, right. Is how can we have wars without public dissension, basically without an anti-war movement, and and um, and you know don't have a lot of casualties is, is the main way to do it. Now the Afghanistan situation is interesting because it's sort of a hybrid of the Vietnam War and the war in Laos put together uh, because yeah. the war in, the war in Laos is uh, was a CIA war primarily as you mentioned the Hmong people there are people living up in the mountains and the whole country is is still like the most primitive country in the world and back there's like one road in the entire country and you know it's just they didn't really have running water back in the 60s it's so primitive in fact uh, the Hmong people uh, back then uh, until the CA got with them, they were people that didn't live under government rule. Uh, they're, you could call them a- a- anarchists almost. They're living up mm-hmm. in a, in the mountains of Laos and China and they would burn, they burn agriculture, uh, and then move to another area and make some crops, burn it. So it's like a slash and burn type farming. And that's how they were growing their opium and, and, and sending that out. And along with the opium, they would make some food and stuff like that. And that's their, that was their society. They weren't paying taxes. And one of the reasons they do the slash and burn agriculture is to get away from government because they don't want to pay taxes. It's, it's a, a interesting <laughs> phenomena. So what happens is the Laos is such a primitive country. There's like one little city there and it becomes a cold war. Um, hot spot in in the minds of China, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and, and the Vietnamese, like because it's a landlocked country uh, between China and Vietnam and Thailand, and there's uh, competition on trying to control this whole place, and no one could really get control of it because of the geography. Much like Afghanistan, it's very difficult for a central government to control that nation, and um, so with uh, Laos. 
It was a hidden war from the American people. Even this documentary won't even talk about it 30 years later. It's not a secret war anymore, but it was back then. And the way it was fought was a couple of CIA guys were living with these Hmong uh, men in the mountains and giving them food and giving them weapons. And by feeding them, it, it made them dependent upon the CIA and we were giving them doing this with airdrops and these CIA guys under contract for training them. And then you had air America coming in there and air flights and, and, you know, supposedly shipping out drugs on the way back home. Uh, and, and air America was a contract CIA airline. Uh, and, uh, so, the other way the war was fought, though, was through bombing, mass bombing, just as big as the bombing in, Nor- in Vietnam. Uh, it was bombed more than any country in Europe, Laos was, which is crazy. Is in, in all human history, it's the one country that's received more bombs per person than any country in any war in human history. Now, I think you know the similarity, the lesson to learn from that today is Afghanistan – uh, is sort of a similar type war. Yes, we got a couple bases over there, but it's a war primarily being fought with small units of Americans and bomb strikes through drones, and now Trump with some bigger bombs for I don't I don't really understand why. Yeah, the, the so, Moab. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know the purpose of that except for fun, a TV ratings boost, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, um, yeah, but, but the point is, like, even today, you know, I, <laughs> Iraq is – Afghanistan is definitely not a secret war. I mean, you could – I know a few people went over there, but um, in, in, in American television it is. It's a hidden war and Iraq and everything else. Uh, it's Korea now overshadows it, and, and it's been that way since the beginning and probably always will be. To me, though, there's another lesson uh, about all this stuff, and – and that's, you know, something I'm, you know, I didn't know 10 years ago and, and learning from the past couple of years doing research is why are we involved in these different things? And there's going to be, there's multiple reasons, but, uh, in the view of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, the origins, what they wanted to get involved heavily in Vietnam for, uh, after the French effort failed was primarily to get bases in Asia to block China. Uh, in 19, mm-hmm. and, uh, that's their primary motivation starting, uh, around the time of the Dien Bien Phu crisis. That's when the U.S. really talked, you know, debated, uh, about getting involved. And some members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff wanted us to get involved and even, uh, send troops possibly. A couple of them didn't, though. Uh, the, ar- the head of the Army didn't. The, the head of the Marines didn't. But the Air Force, top head of the Air Force and Navy, they both wanted us to get involved then. Uh, so there was a split in the military and what to do. But by 1959, um, and, and the transition with the Kennedy administration, and uh, as Kennedy comes into office, Aleo starts to blow up again as a crisis. And, and there's a renewed debate again about all this stuff. And their whole plan was for um, the, the region wasn't, let's go – their their object the Joint Chiefs of Staff objective wasn't let's go make a counterinsurgency let's do nation building let's send hundreds of thousands of people and do a war of attrition as it became but their initial objective was let's just get a base in Laos at first mm-hmm. uh, and and we got a war plan if if the North Vietnamese don't like that and come in we'll bomb them if China then comes in we'll nuke them I mean literally they wanted they said we're going to nuke this base in China. And that was their game plan, and they didn't. And they brought that to Kennedy uh, in April 1961, uh, and Kennedy said no. And then, um, <laughs> and and then he they presented the same basic sort of plan for uh, South Vietnam, uh, and Kennedy instead said, "Okay, I'm not going to do all that, but we're going to uh, intervene in South Vietnam with." training and support of DM to try to forestall communism. You want to put bases there and have this game plan. We're not doing that, but I, I agree we've got to do something. So that's what I think are the origins of the war. Now, I think that applies to today because today we've got bases all over the world. And I think 
the, the only logical reason I can see for the war in Afghanistan at this point is simply to have these bases there as a block against China and Pakistan. Other than that, the whole thing's completely pointless. So uh, that's that's in my I think that's the strategic reason. Um, and uh, I just read Scott Horton has done this great book on the, on a, the Afghanistan war today, and he's got like a list of all the different arguments that have been given you know, by the government officials and why we got to be over there. And that's really the only one that makes any rational sense. Nobody can right in their right mind can believe we can succeed at nation building over there after we've been there for 15 years or even defeat the Taliban after 15 years. But we can maintain bases over there, you know, with a low grade form of warfare, perhaps indefinitely. Well, uh, as John McCain said, for the next hundred years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in my, but my my ultimate thing though about this is um, that's the only logical argument. However, uh, it, it, I go back to the one of the, the Vietnam War. Okay, we're going to put all these bases to block China and and wage this giant war. But in the end, the South Vietnam, the the people of Vietnam didn't need us. They didn't like China anyway, or they didn't want to be their puppets. And, well, and, and, we, and, yeah. and and so forth. So it's all kind of pointless. If we left Afghanistan, is that does that mean that the country of Afghanistan is going to become uh, an arm of Pakistan or China? No, it's going to be what it's always been. The same thing Laos has been for centuries, basically a pit of the world of a bunch of mountains and a and a city and that that is unable to control the countryside, and it's never been able to do so, and it never will because. It's just a bunch of damn mountains. <laughs> so. Well, and you know, it, it's so funny too. I mean, the, the uh, as you were saying there again with the, the, these uh, the ideas is creating a base, and and again, I, I would argue the only other reason to be in Afghanistan is to control the uh, the poppy trade, right? Um, you know, okay. and, and I think that you know, just the the whole you know, like what um, Alvin McCoy would you know, the sort of heroin as a commodity, um, right? And you know, to control, and again, I mean, you can just see that. Uh, you know, it's very en vogue right now to talk about the opioid crisis. And I'm sure, you know, Ken Burns has got an opinion on that. But again, you wouldn't know about it from his film. But even well, so, uh, you're saying there, um, I'll just throw this out quickly, the, the idea that of creating bases, you know, and Afghanistan is essentially, you know, that is a, a some sort of a, a stopgap in terms of China, Pakistan, these other things. And, and you can make that argument that, you know, back in... 48 when Truman was, uh, you know, first sort of looking at Vietnam that this was, you know, they saw the writing on the walls, especially in the 50s. We need to have a base in Southeast Asia. We need, you know, this is more, this is, you know, forget these platitudes and, and rhetoric about communism. It, it is also about having a footprint in Southeast Asia, understanding that it's strategically important and that China's right there. So why not have a country that we can control? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, another uh, the, the, you suggested, uh, uh, you know, and a financial benefit, okay, mm -hmm. from from heroin trade in these in these in Afghanistan and Laos, uh, that Laos being a side benefit of the Vietnam War, and that's one thing that happens in Iraq uh, uh, today. Uh, the whole middle Dan the whole Middle East, you know, the Vietnam War uh, destroyed Cambodia and Laos. It became uh, it destroyed that region of the world for, for decades. Uh, and the Iraq war has done the same thing to the Middle East, basically. The whole ISIS Syria thing is, uh, you know, wouldn't be going on if it wasn't for the, the d destruction of Iraq. But the, the benefit, you know, be beyond bases, I mean, I'm trying to give a strategic view of what Pentagon players or, or people or, or would argue is that, um, Okay, people benefit from war too. Uh, I mean, the the, uh, the the crudest way is the military-industrial complex and these companies with their contracts, the building bombs and supplies and this and that. There's definitely a, a financial aspect to all this stuff. And those companies, they've got lobbies, they got think tanks, they fund and this and that. Mm -hmm. Another another people that benefit is the military itself. Uh, the way the military is structured, you got to rise up in rank by completing missions. 
So there's no better way to do, you know, do that than go to go to Afghanistan or one of these countries where there's a war going on and, and get your stripes and be able to come back home. So there's all these other kind of bureaucratic, bureaucratic and uh, interest and financial interest in, in getting these things going. But in the end, I, I don't, you know, in the books I write, I don't really spend much time about that because um I don't think that's, you know, the, the motivation of the people once they get to the, the positions of power of the White House and the, uh, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and so forth. I really think it's pure power, like politics and trying to control the world uh, is, is the way they see things uh, and manage this. You know, McNamara, um, <laughs> he, he uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, these, these people, like the, you mentioned, you talked about Henry Kissinger. I saw a quote of Henry Kissinger once where he said, when you're young, a young man, you know, and Henry Kissinger, someone that slept with lots of women. Uh, he said, when you're a young man, you enjoy sex, uh, and, and, and power. And he says, once you are an old man, you don't care about sex, but you still care about power. Well, <laughs> that's not a normal way uh, a normal person thinks. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. That is a normal way these people think. So, and, and, and Leslie Gelb too, most likely. You know, someone very ambitious to. You know, well, I was thinking about the one thing I said about this morning. I mean, uh, people that work in in the military at this level, there were the, that rise up. So, uh, my dad was a colonel in the army. And, um, and there's, you know, lots of people that go into the military and they don't become colonels or generals or, or whatever, uh, they don't rise up. And, and the way you rise up, I've said it already is you, you complete a mission that makes your superior officer look good. And then you can, you, you please him and he writes a good recommendation and, and, and you're able to move up and rank. That's the basic way it works. However, uh, the people at the very top of, of this stuff, are extremely ambitious people and they're basically workaholics. Uh, I mean, it's not like these guys are making millions of dollars to go play on the beach. Uh, this general Mattis is in his mid seventies and you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't want to be living in DC and traveling around the world and doing these things nonstop at 75 years old or be this Tillerson character or, or much less Donald Trump. Um, so these are people like addicted to working and, and having power and just, it's a little crazy. Uh, really? <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, no, no. It's an insane lifestyle, um, to, to, to want to pursue. Um, you know, and, uh, I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't even thinking about, you know, how old is, uh, is General Mattis, but yeah, he must be, um, oh, he's 67. Oh, he's younger than I thought. Okay. Yeah. Well, but still, I mean, he's getting yeah. up there. I mean, yeah, um, sure. You know, he certainly, he's not a spry young man anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, uh, no, absolutely. And I just wanted to, it just sort of popped in my head earlier when you were talking. Um, again, this whole, uh, just because, and again, hindsight, whatever. But this whole, you know, China's going to take over Southeast Asia. And, you know, you mentioned that, first of all, they, they fought oh. a pretty nasty little war with Vietnam. But on top of that, even now, when Vietnam is still ostensibly a communist country, they're not, they don't like China either. They're a competitor with China. Um, you know, uh, for, and they're, they're, they play America and China off one another, uh, in terms of, uh, economic, uh, incentives and things like that. But, you know, again, I, you know, Vietnam is, I think it, one lesson people should really take away, you know, is that they've always wanted to maintain their own independence. They never wanted to be beholden to anybody. And it's a, it's a misnomer that they were, um, you know, it was about international con. They might have used that in order to achieve their own ends, but they, I don't think they ever wanted to be beholden to the Chinese or the Soviets. Oh, yeah, there's a good, good little story about this, too. Uh, so in Northern Virginia, um, there's a great book uh, called Covert Capital that's, that's real interesting to read. It's an academic book, uh, so it doesn't read like a novel, but what it's about is the D.C. area and how – there's, you know, all these Americans in the intelligence community, that's where they all live. But there's also all these refugees from all these wars that come there that work for the CIA. Mm. So, you know, that's so, you know, oh, we you got know, Michael, we're, we're just about to hit the. Break. Oh, OK. OK. Um, but um, maybe maybe we could stick around and uh, record, uh, uh, keep recording a little bit and we can uh, throw that up for uh, members on Patreon. OK. Um, Michael Swanson, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, you can go to thewarstate.com to find all of Michael's work. 
Uh, you can also hear him on Tuesdays on the uh, on Chuck Ocelli show, and hopefully again on this show as well. And uh, if you want to support me, then of course you can go to patreoncom slash Redmond. Michael Swanson, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Great talking with you. Since the beginning, civilizations have risen and fallen. Rome, ancient Persia, Mongolia, Britain, and now America. Befallen by natural disasters, broken families, moral decay, lack of preparedness and conflict. Don't let this happen to you. Are you prepared? Would you like to help others prepare? AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com is looking for distributors. Email BugOutAmerica at USA.com Go to AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com A veteran-owned and operated company. But do it today. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me. <laughs> American Freedom Radio, Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network and, uh, and we just need that so much. And when we're not invading some sovereign nation or setting it on fire from the air, which is more fun for our Nintendo pilots, then, then we're usually declaring war on something here at home. Did you ever notice that about us? We love to declare war on things here in America. Anything we don't like about ourselves, we declare war on it. We don't do anything about it. We just declare war on it. It's the only metaphor, the only metaphor we have in our public discourse for solving problems, declaring war. We have to declare a war on everything. We have a war on crime, the war on poverty, the war on litter, the war on cancer, the war on drugs. But you ever notice we got no war on homelessness, huh? No war on homelessness. You know why? There's no money in that problem. No money to be made off of the homeless. If you could find a solution, if you could find a solution to homelessness where the corporate swine and the politicians could steal a couple of million dollars each, you see the streets of America begin to clear up pretty quick. I'll guarantee you that. I will guarantee you that. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com 
or volunteer by emailing American Freedom Radio at ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs, and artillery batteries not included. Launch sequence initiated. Mind to experience American Freedom Radio.